Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 17 of the hashtag 3WEDU broadcast. We're really excited to have Kristen Powers join us today to talk about systemic change. And this is our final episode of the 2016-17 academic year. So we will be taking the summer off and picking up in the fall. So to start out, I just want to know what everyone uh, is drinking tonight. And I can start. I am actually drinking Create World Peace Tea that can be purchased at Mandible Cafe at Cornell campus. Probably other places too, but you can come here and have some World Peace Tea with me. And I put a link to it in the doc. Uh, and here in Ithaca, it is a lovely 70 degree blue sky, just awesome perfect day so we're all really happy here and the academic year has finished and graduation is this weekend and I would just like to make a little shout out to the Syracuse University and Washington State University rowing teams that will both be competing at the NCAA championships this weekend in Princeton New Jersey uh, because both my daughters row there so go Cougs and go Chargers and I'll be wearing both uh, both pieces of clothing this weekend just to really confuse people. So, Lori, welcome. Do you want to share with us what you're up to tonight and what you're drinking? Hi, I'm on my laptop. Hi, Kristen. Hi. <laughs> um, I got 20 bottles of wine delivered to me because I'm such a procrastinator and I'm never home that I have two wine clubs and they keep trying to deliver them to me and no one's here to sign for them. So they all showed up yesterday when I said, I'm home. So today I'm drinking from Edna Valley, a Chardonnay. Um, it's from the, um, it's called, it's the, the winery is Baleana and this is their La Pristina Chardonnay. And I'm just pouring it because I just got here. Hi. Uh, and Laura, how about you? What are you up to this evening? It is evening where you are. It is evening, yeah. I'm already in outdoor research, so summer mode is on for me as I hit the hills and go hiking this weekend. But I'm drinking a, a wine that we put away two years ago called Jolie from Becker Wine Vineyards. They won, like, a, of course, they won a championship uh, wine tasting at a, I believe it was a Stampede or one of our local um, cow and stock trade shows. So it's 2014, it's an experiment because it should have gone off. And I asked my partner in crime where it came from. He's like, oh yeah, that could be a wine that we could be lost. So Nori, don't let those 20 balls just sit there, which I know you won't, I know. Uh, so yeah, it's pretty tasty, it's light, it's fruity, it's summer, so bring on the break. I'm looking forward to it. And Tanya, how about you tonight? Um, sadly, I, um, I'm Tanya, by the way, from University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Sadly, I am drinking nada today, except for water, um, because I've been sick and I'm on a bunch of prescription meds. I think about 50% of them interact with alcohol, so we already know I'm a little loose-lipped on the show to begin with, so I don't think we need narcotics and alcohol combo to, like, heighten that at all, so to save everybody or to reduce the your um, entertainment show. value. Let's what? do an after show and get Tanya taped. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it'll take much at this point. So, yep, I'm drinking water today, folks. <laughs> and, Jess, I'm not sure I, if you're with us or not. I can see a picture. It sounds like not. Uh, Okay, so when Jess joins in, uh, we'll have her hop in to share what she's drinking and what she's doing tonight. Uh, in the meantime, I wanted to introduce Kristen. Kristen and, Kristen and I met at the OLC Innovate last fall where she just shared a really incredible story of how her and her team led some systemic change in their organization and how that really helped them create a more inclusive and diverse environment and so we're really excited to have her on the show tonight to talk with us and she currently lives and works in seattle although she will share with us in a little bit where she is uh this evening and why 
And she works with a strategy and design firm called Intentional Futures. And if you're interested in learning more about the company, there's a link to some, an article and some information on them in our show notes. She's an associate director on the education team, primarily focused on post-secondary research and online learning. And she also uh, helped us out at the OLC Innovate as a, um, in the Solution Design Summit. And so it was really, really awesome to have her there as well. And I hope that she join us, joins us at SDS again next year. She loves teaching art and English, collecting salts, which I want to hear more about, and reading about black holes. And she's passionate about empathy in the classroom, neuroscience, oxytocin research, playful learning, instructional design, and serious games. And I love that she shared a few uh, interesting nuggets. She's interested in, uh, she owned a vegan gluten-free bakery called Sweet Tooth, and she holds two international first place awards for face painting. And we definitely want to see some pictures of that. <laughs> so Kristen, I'll turn it over to you now if you want to share uh, with everyone where you are tonight and what you're celebrating, and then just give us a little overview of what's going on at Intentional Futures. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm so excited to be here because um, I think you all are fabulous and amazing. Uh, and I'm, I am in Florida getting to celebrate our matriarch. Um, my grandmother is turning 91 today. So we are here getting all the family together. Um, it has been pouring rain and we got real Florida rainstorms, which are unlike Seattle rainstorms. Seattle is kind of piddly fizz all day. And here it's just like torrential drop if you're in the water for two seconds, you're soaked forever. Um, so it's pretty beautiful, uh, different. I love it being here temporarily and then getting to go back home. Um, so yeah, the the drink I'm having today is a, a 2017 purified H2O because I'm also getting over a fibromyalgia flare. So I'm not doing any uh, any drug mixing either. So we're we're a fun bunch tonight. I, I can tell. <laughs> uh, let's see. Where would you like me to start with um, if sort of sort of like the the timeline of what's been changing? Yeah, yeah if you want to start with uh, what drove the you know the need for doing something and then how you kind of developed the idea and built a coalition and mm -hmm. how that you know how that kind of played out. Sure, sure, sure. And and I'll caveat all of this with like I am um, not in any HR position. I'm just part of a larger set of people who are part of getting it done and making things happen there. So I attribute a lot of the, the change that's happening to our leaders and our team. We've got an amazing team that run our office. And um, so there's caveat. Um, I've just been lucky to experience working for an organization that really is trying to play out what transparency and feedback and communication looks like. So I've been at Intentional Futures um, almost about a year and a half. And what I've found there, which is so different from other working environments, is that there are uh, there's a real desire for people to question and put things in place to test and iterate and try to find ways to make things better. And that the leadership is constantly asking, what can we do to make this better for you? Or how can we better support you? Which having that level of um, openness to questioning and openness to even looking for ways to improve the situation is kind of the first step, which has amazed me being there. Um, so over the, the last year, what I've seen sort of transpire was really interesting is we have a lot of junior producers on our team who are young women. And we were having this Slack channel, uh, which was dedicated to the women at, in the office It looks like Kristen may have been kicked off for a second, or she'll be back. Um, 
there are some just a quick announcement as we're kind of waiting for her to log in log out um, there are some questions and there's some conversations being funneled to our back channel back channels are on the Google Docs and I'll tweet it out the bit.ly 3wedu17 or the hashtag 3wedu so and Kristen's back so I let her finish so all right cool all right looks like Google is not on my side tonight <laughs> Um, so we were using the Slack channel, and what started to happen was more and more serious discussion about women being heard in the office. And this conversation of we we work in a very tech-heavy industry. Um, our office has uh, not just an education group, but we have a technology group, we have a social impact group, we have a design team, and we have a product uh, development that's working with you know. Big companies trying to develop new and interesting technology advances, and all of this is happening where um, most of the business is done by like we just know people, so we pull people in. And we were finding that because it was founded by two guys who used to work at Microsoft, that a lot of what was happening just unconsciously was pulling in more guys from Microsoft or people that they knew in their network. And what this conversation started evolving was because of these unconscious biases that you know were just happening in our network and not expanding to include more voices and diversity um, the same thing was happening where more white males were being pulled into our office who were from the tech industry who didn't have any experience working with women in leadership or women in a, a collaborative role just because of their experience and so we kept finding that we were in meetings um, and the junior producer were feeling like they weren't being heard. They didn't know how to step up. They didn't know what what were the best ways to even have a conversation. Some of our clients are, you know, 70 year old white males from, you know, big cities with lots of money and like there's nothing to talk about because we don't have yachts. and. You know, it, it was just, um, it was really eye-opening to have them start this conversation about how they wanted to be heard. So that initiated the first part of this was just a, a call to action that said, hey, these junior women in our office aren't feeling like they're being represented and they don't know how to share their good ideas because they're self-conscious and they don't have a lot of practice being in these environments and it's not a lack of skill or a lack of talent. It was just that they weren't seeing in a lot of the meeting spaces those sort of supportive models that you would get if you had a lot of other women leaders in the room. Um, so those conversations developed into a bigger conversation around, well, if this is happening, you know, what else is going on that we maybe aren't attentive and aware of? In the office, it has to do with, you know, other types of diversity and inclusion. If if our junior women are feeling supported or heard, what else could be happening in our office? So, we started to have these meetings where we were able to sit down with specific leadership and our team to say, "Hey, this is going on." To actually talk through some of the concerns, to have have the people who were really feeling left out represent themselves and feel validated and and heard because we, i really think that that's kind of what it comes down to um and we, we were able to make some amazing movement forward just to be able to have the discussion and then able to open it up into a larger field so since then this is like over a course of a year we've been able to have these larger discussions about what is even diversity mean and how does diversity show up in our work practice, whether that's starting with hiring or looking at the actual research that we do in our research and survey methods or more deeply into the way that we report and um, how that we put out, you know, solely digital media reports, who are we excluding by doing that and just starting to be more intentional about um, what it means to be diverse and what diversity looks like. And so having these conversations um, with, with leadership that actually supports us has been, uh, I feel like I work in a unicorn office. 
<laughs> it's been amazing. So I'll pause there to catch my breath. <laughs> um, um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's I, mean, I mean, it, it sounds, sounds like having, having sort of sort of was, was a really important really first, first step for you. Um, what do you think, you know, if there's other people out there listening that are wondering, you know, how do I get this movement started? You know, how can I, how can I bring this to my leadership? Do you have any suggestions for them? I think Kristen froze up again. Uh, do you have to unmute her, Laura? Oh, my bad. Okay. Um, one of the things that we did when we had our first conversation with the founder and co-founder is we started to put together research that had been accumulated on offices that had more diversity um, and also research on um, women in leadership roles and how those companies actually make more money. And so we were trying to gather as much data as we could to support this movement to say, hey, you know, this isn't just about us. This is about better business, better decisions, more creativity. The, the idea of even just having the same type of person in theory making all the same type of decisions, we know that that doesn't lead to creative thinking. So having uh, diversity in any of our creative practices in any of our conversations makes us better at the job we do. So we were able to make that conversation uh, a business development conversation that really needed to happen anyways. So the, uh, has anybody else, Nori or Tanya or Jess, have you, at where you are, um, you know, started to lead anything like this or have, have examples? That you want to share? I oh, Nori, go ahead. Um, I think that Jess is not going to um, join us any further today due to technical difficulties, and she's also not feeling well. Um, so. A lot of you know, and Kristen, you probably don't, is one of my areas of research and teaching is in um, organizations. And so I've done a lot on, I've taught courses on diversity and communication and leadership and organizational change and all of that good stuff. Um, and so I have in my own units implemented that. Um, I sort of wanted to pass back a question. You know, we know for the research for 50 plus years, that diversity in teams adds to better um, productivity and better outcomes. You know, it's very clear in the research. Um, but when we talk about putting together diverse teams or teams that have heterogeneity, a lot of people um, approach that in a different way or exactly what that means, you know? Some people are like, yes, let's just hire a woman and a non-white person and we'll call our team diverse and let's make it happen. Could you give us a little bit more specifics? I know exactly. Check woman, check non-white. All right, good to go. Um, could you talk a little bit more about what you all um, came to, you know, came to believe and what diversity actually meant and what diverse people and diverse processes actually meant, maybe in a little bit more detail? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, thank you for digging into that. I, uh, oh, so, when we um, when we had that conversation about like hey we just want to feel heard then we moved on to having a conversation about what is diversity and we tried we did an activity where we tried to think of all the different ways that could be represented um, and we we did a sticky note activity on the wall and so things that were um, surprising to us that we just kind of forget in our space because we're in our own space. Um, the ageism that we have that's really persistent um, and that's hard to break because we're all of a certain age group and we don't have networks that are um, as diverse in, in the age groups. I think also the, the sort of approach in terms of diversity in um, you know the backgrounds, whether you were thinking about um, people from big cities and small cities, from um, 
family cultures that are very traditional you know, or cultures that are more, you know, thinking about openness and how those implicit biases come in. So it was really anything that could um, shut off your way of saying yes and to research or yes and to something. I, I'm putting this in like a, a improv terms because that's how it always makes sense to me is how do you um, how do you think about diversity in terms of people showing their vulnerability, and that the framing of showing somebody's like true self in a way that that always felt like the most inclusive way to describe inclusivity? If that makes sense. Well, I think. Another piece of that, as I'd mentioned, is processes. So it's great and a great advice for the listeners is doing sort of that diversity brainstorming activity, like in all and what are all of the different areas in which we're diverse? Because a lot of people just think of like EEOC guidelines and they don't think beyond that. Yeah. So I think that's a really interesting activity. One of the things that I've witnessed as well is like, okay, so we've got a bunch of different people. We've got this diverse team that we've put together. We think that we're really appreciating this diversity, but then every time somebody tries to suggest something new, we're like, oh, that's not the way we do it. So it's interesting because we're still, um, we're getting this diverse team, but then we're saying, nope, this is our group and this is the way we've always done it. And they're probably patriarchal structures and we're gonna continue to do it this way. So how did you learn to truly appreciate each other's and those new ideas and opinions about how you do business? That's great. So um, a practice that I've seen that's been really useful in getting diversity in processes and getting people to um, move forward in uh, new ways of taking in information, synthesizing that information, and then distributing it, because I think that's a lot of what we look at in this work, is um, there's a a design process, I'm gonna forget the name of. It's where it's like a methodology of hats. Um, so you have different hats for different types of feedback. I've seen that work really well so that people are forced to think outside of what they would normally give back. And this is kind of like in a in a collaboration setting, some processes that work at least is to frame this. And then um, the other one I really like is I like giving people personas in meetings. I feel like that gets people out of their comfort zone and forces them to think um, about another person. So it, it's kind of that empathetic connection of thinking like, oh, well, if I was, you know, uh, a 50 year old guy or a 30 year old woman from Pakistan, like how would I approach this problem differently? And suddenly there's this brainstorming that happens. Um, so those are some design process ones. I think in terms of culture, uh, getting a culture that really um, encourages and supports growth mindset. So the idea that you would be in an environment where, yes, we can check off that we've got a diverse team, but we're not actually supporting or motivating diverse thinking and practices. We don't, we don't offer incentives for people who think differently. We don't we don't encourage that feedback, we don't evaluate ourselves, those things don't match. So you have to definitely have an environment and a culture that that wants, um, wants to be questioned and iterated on and doesn't have, uh, doesn't have so many sacred cows, which is hard in education because we're all about sacred cows. <laughs> Laura, do you have any questions for Kristen or our thoughts on uh diversity where you are? Um, no, it sounds interesting because I think I've talked with Kristen about this too. I'm glad that I came to our, that panel in Orlando and had a mimosa with Kristen. Um, so we could chat about a little bit around, I think it's perspective taking, which I like that you brought that up. And I wonder if and how, and I think of it as, because um, culture is everything, right? So I wonder how current organizations or teams can start the process if they haven't really thought of it, um, or, or like what's the small, because we know system, systemic change is challenging, but there's lots of low hanging fruit or items they could first look at, and meetings is a good example. Are there other kind of in practice, what you do or in behavior, um, that, that's really where it comes from, that people could think about looking at or modifying or changing or just evaluating to start? 
Um, yeah. So that makes me want to get on my soapbox about social emotional learning, but <laughs> that, that is, um, that's a good stepping stone at least. Uh, I think that one of the things that we miss out on in the, what happens with big change, right? One of the things that we skip in the discussion is how do we take into account the emotions that an individual is gonna have when those changes happen and how scary that might be and dealing with that fear in a way that's like healthy and actually lets people feel comfortable about expressing those things. Um, so I, I think small practices that are frequently repeated that help people feel safe are a great small step. So um, one of the things that we do in a lot of our meetings is just do sort of like an emotional check-in, like, go around the room, where's everybody at today? And you know, where are you coming at, you know, at this meeting, and it can be a meeting about product design or user experience or, you know, some new research, but we want to be um, human centered in all of our work practices, and not just in theory, right in practice. So if you have a uh, five minutes to go around a room and have people actually touch base that creates a safe space for someone to say, actually, like you guys have done, I'm having a hard day today. I'm, I'm coming at this like half full and I'm not feeling great. So I'm not gonna contribute fully, but that means that your team can support you. And so that's that vulnerability again and that perspective taking of being able to go, I've had those days, I know what that's like. Like I would love for someone to say, it's okay, I, we've got this. Like that's what I need when I feel down. I want someone to do that for me. So like giving other people that opportunity when you're vulnerable um, those like five minute moments in a meeting can change a team dynamic so quick. Like that's huge. I love that idea of small practices and quick wins and, you know, in sustaining them. I mean, we talk about that all the time when we talk about, you know, innovating, and moving a new project or uh, idea forward, and especially the, uh, the human centered uh, human centered work and the you know applying what we do in our business to our actual workforce uh, Nori what do you what are you thinking or what do you want to share with us sorry I got cut off for a little while so give me a moment I have I, I'm just still doing my tech connection <laughs> Google has not been very uh, very friendly to us this no, night. Not kind. Yeah. Okay. I think we might we might reconvene after not using Google for the summer and talk about another space. But I was gonna I just I'll talk about like I think um, initiating hiring. I've been thinking a lot about how we hire talent and how we bring people into our teams. And I don't know if we do it really well in higher ed, at least broadly. There are some schools, and institutions, and workplaces that are, um, but we could do better. And I was listening to Kim Scott on the Radical Candor, and, and there's this, an assumption that I think team fit means everything. And talking about this up, it's not just the this is the physical look. Um, like the U.S. is the only country that asks what's your ethnicity um, and asks your military service. Like so, that was new coming in. I had to identify an ethnic. Um, group, but not just physical diversity, but diversity of personalities and individuals when you create a team and what that would look like. And on an interview, you see people in, in certain spaces or places, but you could give them example questions or you could definitely be following up with references, which many people don't, I've learned. Um, but you can, you can get a better idea if you set up an interview that's multi-perspective and maybe they have to present if that's in their role or maybe they have to share something like a talent or portfolio like that's kind of what i was thinking is we could do better with interviewing and hiring and selecting and planning for that up front and then hire really great talents that you still can develop but they're great to start and you have a better idea of where they're coming from um, that fits your team and not just uh, inclusion or diverse checkbox that we mentioned i think that's kind of something i've been thinking about I think we're um, just pulling out a couple themes here from Kristen's talk, building off of what you were saying, Laura, you know, and just tying in with other discussions that we've had. So, um, Kristen, you had talked about just bringing in great people, and we've talked a lot about how 
And it's interesting because I know these are EEOC HR things to protect us and they're supposed to be to make us all equal and have equal hiring. But in the same way, they limit us. So like the over obsessive job description that lists 100 things that they want that are so specific and that women don't apply for because unless we're 100% a fit, we don't. So you had talked about just pulling in great people. And I think that's something that we need to figure out how to do a better job of. Mm -hmm. um, you know, building um, careers in part around just really fabulous people with great skill sets. And I think we know that great leaders are able to do that. They're able to pick out the strengths of their team members and build upon those. You also talked about perspective taking um, in um, the diversity of processes. And that's something um, with Wiggins and McTeague in my classroom that I tried to build. So perspective taking and empathy and I just met someone a few weeks ago when um, I was at a convening in Harvard and we talked a lot about that, um, that the traditional learning outcomes don't touch on um, building perspective taking and empathy. Um, we really focus on the cognitive and not the effective or behavioral realms, which you were talking about your social emotional learning soapbox, which I'm sure I would be up there as well. Um, and so that's another one, the whole social emotional learning and social emotional intelligence and making sure that we are um, hitting students not only with the cognitive development, but also making sure those other realms are developing. And then you talked about um, the fifth one was that idea of care in the office, which we've talked about, um, which ties into social emotional, but checking in like, how's everyone doing today? You know, um, who's hanging in there? Because we know everyone has a bad day. And if you could take two minutes to have empathy for someone's bad day, um, they're most likely to be more committed to the team and, and have greater outcomes. So I think these are things that are only not important in the workplace, but they're important considerations for those of us who teach in higher ed or, or work in higher ed. So um, just those are just five themes I pulled out quickly. I know that tied into some of our other discussions. I, I just wanted to check in with Nori to see if uh, your audio is working and if you want to jump in. Yeah. I, I, you know, I know Kristen's team really well because we work together all the time. And I know that, I know you're- I'm so sorry, I think I've been calling you Kristen. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> Christine. What's that? No, it's Kristen. I think we just, we just lost Kristen. Am I still here? Yes, okay. So here. one of the, yeah, one of the things that, I was thinking about in my uh, in my program, we, we talked a lot about different leadership styles in the organizational leadership program I was just in. And I can remember, you know, I had some really gut reactions to some of these leadership styles and theories that we learned about. And the one that really rubbed me the wrong way was servant leadership, where you're sort of at the mercy, like your whole job of being a leader is almost it was too spiritual or too religious for me about like bringing people up, but the transformational leadership theory and the idea of being extremely aware of the power that you have and the ability for your power to then empower the people that work for you, that particular leadership style resonated with me. And I think as you're talking and, you know, I know Greg and, uh, you know, I work with Rich, I, I know, your principal or your, uh, that, you know, Greg is one of the founders. And there's something really um, powerful about understanding how significant it is that the people who work for you are actually working with you and what it is to empower those people and how how that changes processes. And I know you had talked about research early on. One of the things you said was sort of that bottom line that that organizations that um, have diverse workforces tend to make more money. And that's a really important doorway to step through because it's one thing to feel good all the time. And that falls back to that sort of servant leadership, which just bugged me so much that I just couldn't wrap my head around being a servant leader that is there to purely serve all people from a role in leadership. But I appreciate that a transformational leader who has at their core this idea of also making money since the business that you're in 
is the is the you know everybody's there to do some kind of an exchange where ultimately you make a good living for the work that you're that you're doing. I think it's all those pieces that I've recognized in your organization, and I think it's significant that um, it's really hard to do. You know, I've never really worked. Uh, I shared on this show. I had a mentor years ago, um, Bob Blackney, and I haven't worked with him for. I don't know, more than 10 years, but he touched my career over a long period of time where he both mentored me and was my boss, and he was a transformational leader. Like His whole gig was moving everybody forward, and I know what it's like to work on a team like that, but it's really, really hard to find. So there's my thoughts. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, unfortunately, Jess never uh, made it back in. But I just wanted to check in with you, Kristen, because I know you have somewhere. Uh, I'll I'll respond to that. To be, and I'll I didn't know that, if that works. <laughs> Sweet. Um. Yeah. No. That I um. I I'm glad that you get to work with me in a variety of capacities because I think you see how uh, how much working in that office has really like been awesome and supportive and that. It really is. Um, it really is a culture of everybody wants to help and support everybody else. And um, what you're saying and what resonates with me right now is actually, um, I have a family member who's about to go through a job transformation, and they've been asking for advice about like, what do I, what do I do about where do I work? Because they're in a place where they believe in the vision. They buy into the vision, they love their customers, they love what they're doing, they love the product, but their leadership is just not um, in any way supportive, like either emotionally or mentally or you know, in terms of business development, the leadership's just not there. So I was saying that like you need to find a place where both the leadership and the vision are aligned in a place where you feel like you can be your best. And if has done that somehow they've found people who really believe in the vision of storytelling and strategic design and creative thinking and being a little weird and we're all kind of weirdos in some way and we're quirky and we have weird ass backgrounds and they've found a way to put us together in a room um and i think when uh, more more people are intentional about those decisions, about who they bring to the conversation, about who that they're including in their decisions, then you get that empowered process where people feel like they're actually contributing meaningfully and that everybody who is involved when they're contributing meaningfully wants to do more of that. I mean, the reason we see a lot of um, disengagement both in offices and in education is that people feel like they're not doing something meaningful. So. I think letting people feel validated and and being able to recognize the humanness and approach it holistically, all of those are like mindset shifts that actually change into processes and practices and behaviors. So it's kind of got to start with a mindset shift. So that's my my peace out. Um, love each other. Be, be good to each other. <laughs> I'm gonna go uh, celebrate my grandma's birthday. All right. Well, be sure to tell your uh, your grandmother happy birthday from all of us, and thank her for uh, sharing you with us. I know that time down there is so valuable, uh, and we love you too. Thanks so much for joining us. And we'll talk soon. <laughs> thank you guys so much. This was right. a blast. Weirdos unite! Yeah. <laughs> Weirdos unite. Weirdos forever. <laughs> Bye. All right, I'll try to bring Jess back when you guys talk. Yeah, I thought that was a, a great conversation. And one of the things I really, uh, I'm glad we got into that I've been thinking about is the, you know, the, the people that are in college now or, you know, entering college at whatever age, there are future leaders who are going to be going out and, you know, can lead change and help to make some of these systemic changes. And what kind of experiences and how can we incorporate those experiences into the, you know, into their uh, learning? And as Kristen was talking, I just thought how great it would be if they were invited to, you know, in a webinar to just talk with students or do a case study with them, you know, and, you know, and, and bring more of that real world experience 
into the classroom so students can really better understand, uh, you know, how they can help, how, how they can help lead change. And especially I think that discussion around the differences in diversity, because I do think it's very, um, it's thought of very narrowly in most classrooms probably. Well, I was gonna say outside the classroom, Patrice. So I, I think about how I grew up and I never knew that you could study student affairs or higher ed. Like that's a, that was a phenomenon that I learned in my late twenties. I was like, oh, people study this, this is great. How do you support and help students lead? Because my undergrad said, hey, bring them to the table. So if we have a, a planning meeting to change something on campus, uh, there should be like a faculty, a student, maybe an administrator, a senior, another student, a grad student, but they should be part of that like decision making process or being part of those discussions. So I thought it was like I thought it was normal to sit on a curriculum development committee where our university is doing a hybrid with the community college program. We could talk about curricula, what that might look like. And I learned when I came to institutions in the US, it was not always the same. And positions that were run by students were a staff position. So I think of why aren't we thinking about capacity and having our students lead from their positions, whether they're an undergrad or a grad student, getting them involved or, or thinking about their voice at a table, um, not just at a classroom, but I think a policy table, a change table, uh, uh, something that gets them involved in the campus community itself. So I think um, two things, um, Patrice, in a lot of the classes that I taught around this, we usually have business case studies. And so I think what's important that would be, for example, Kristen's company putting together a business case study or a researcher gathering those sorts of cases um, from more innovative, um, uh, innovative organizations. And so I think that those organizational case studies um, or cases that are used as a learning tool are predominantly where we would see this. Um, as we all know, the publishing of those um, becomes a little bit more difficult or the updating those in real time. So I think it might be interesting in um, getting more series of case studies around um, diversity and, um, and possibly um, leadership that empowers women. Um, you know, Laura, what you were talking about is interesting. Two thoughts came to mind. The first one is um, we, too, I see often it's like, um, and going back to the decision-making literature, but it's like, okay, so we need one student and one faculty member and one whatever. Next thing you know, you have this giant team, and we've got one of everybody on it. <laughs> and it gets to the point where we have so much diversity and heterogeneity that it's completely unproductive. Um, you know, in that nobody can come to a decision or agreement on anything. So I think it really matters on what you expect that team to do as to how many people you put in it and how many roles. I think one of the things we need to be careful is putting that one student or that one woman or that one non-white person, um, you know, that one black person and saying, okay, you're going to represent the view of all students or of all black people in um, the university. Uh, just a couple, you know, things there. The other thing is, I don't know about your guys' university, but we use, we have a student government that's um, pretty prominent. And so our student government is, is, um, is contacted and plays a role in lots of our um, decisions about policy and these sorts of things. And so when it comes to diversity and bringing the student's voice, I, I wonder how many universities are reaching out and involving their student government, because that's specifically the student government's role um, in the university. And I, I know we reach out to them often um, to be involved in some of those things. I'll answer that, Tanya. We were part of government, but we also used a lot of Robert's rules. We had really good facilitation. So like I sat on a really fun committee that had probably four or five students, two faculty, a couple staff, and we'd make the decisions on so-and-so got caught smoking pot on the quad. Now, let's go to the case precinct led by the lawyer. And it was it was fun, and I thought it was kind of empowering to go and go, Let's look at a packet. Let's talk it out. Let's get different viewpoints. But whoever is facilitating, like, that's really what it comes down to. Like you're right, because you could get nothing done. But um, I think you're right. Like involving those that were in positions of uh, residence government, student government, like a union or any sort of kind of representational has always been good. 
Um, yeah, I agree. Uh, but yeah, facilitating those those group works or teams are really important. Yeah. When we're talking about diversity, you know, and diversity in groups, whatever their, their teams, whatever their role is on the campus, I do um, believe you're alluding to, though, an important fact in that a lot of times our student voices aren't heard. Um, so we talk a lot about diversity and we make lots of, um, you know, strategic decisions about what's best for students and we don't really bring them in to the conversation enough. And so I think that's probably one of the most forgotten roles in decision making processes in campuses. In particular, when we get to higher um, administration decisions around budget, you know, very seldom do we have students' voices at the table discussing um, budget matters and those sorts of things, which is really interesting because they're very much impacted by those. I understand they're sensitive. Um, even when we talk about cutting services, um, which we've had to do at our university, and I know others are having to do the same thing. So again, I think um, you know diversity should always be thought of when we're developing these teams. And you know, often um, the more sensitive things get, sort of the mo more closed doors we see the diversity of these teams because people at some point don't want diverse teams. Right. Well, um, when you make sensitive decisions. That comes down to that vulnerability issue of, are you the kind of leader that can be vulnerable about the decisions that are being made? And are you able to pivot on something you feel strongly about when you hear more diverse voices that see something very differently than you? And um, I don't, I just haven't worked with that many higher level administrators and, and people in the field who who can do that kind of listening who can who can do that 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 ego transformation of i'm here for the greater good of an entire institution and my unit functions in this role and these voices i, I remember uh working with somebody who knew, got a new position and I watched as he created this advisory board because that's that's what he was supposed to do. But later I realized it was just such a, it was a token action and all the people that were selected were token advisory committee members. The checklist was, uh, was politically motivated. And you know, of course, I need a black person. I need a female. I need the following three powerful budgets represented. Check, check, check. And in the end, it was simply so that this person could deliver the message he'd already decided to the group of people that were the advisors because there was a singular function that he was there to do and he had already figured it out. And there wasn't, there wasn't that whole idea of being a leader that is flexible and thinks, you know, I know part of the solution for this whatever it is I'm solving, whatever division I'm overseeing, but this solution is um, in process and it will be for the life of an institution. I think you brought up a great point about the importance of listening with intention. And, you know, when you talked about being open and being able to pivot, that really is about really listening, not just hearing what somebody else said and as they're talking, forming your response in your head or thinking, well, I already know the answer to this, but just really, really listening with intention and being thoughtful uh, in asking questions and really trying to, you know, get, really trying to listen for someone's story. How many of you have ever had somebody tell you, like if you push hard, which I have done in my career, and on multiple occasions, someone has said to me, there's more at stake than you realize. And it's, it's with a period at the end. It's not that they're gonna disclose to me what's at stake. They're simply shutting me down by saying, you've pushed this far and here's my, here's my way to tell you very patronizingly that you don't know enough about the decision to be qualified to push back this hard. Has that happened to you guys where you're like, you know that there's something that you're advocating for and there's this moment where you're told. Yeah. I actually had that specifically happen to me, um, which brings me back to sort of what you guys were talking about, like those teams that are put together with those nominal members that you know they're not really diverse in their thought process. 
I mean, you can put a woman on a team, but that doesn't mean that she's going to bring some diverse views that empowers other women. She could just be towing the patriarchal line. And so I think, Nora, you're alluding to where we say we think diverse groups are going to be great. We're thinking out of the box. You know, a lot of times I'm just throwing ideas out there, um, you know, based on whatever I'm thinking. I'm not necessarily emotionally tied to any of them. But I have specifically had things come back um, that was very much like based on, yes, this information, you might think that this is the way to go. But there were four other pieces of information that I didn't have that I was given that more or less shut everything down. It was like, well, more or less, we're going to have to eat this because if we don't, we're going to get um, totally, sorry for lack of a better word, screwed down the line if we don't agree to this because we have bigger arguments and battles that we're trying to have. And they're usually about budget um, and they're usually beyond the institution. Um, and so those are the sorts of things that um, we don't always have the information. So we could think logically and strategically we're supposed to be doing something and we're trying to really push the envelope there and be diverse thinkers, but we don't have all the information. At the end of the day, a lot of administration, they're very political and they're very much making strategic power plays. And who knows at the end if it's really for the good of, you know, for all of us down below. <laughs> And I just want to pivot a little. It's 6.52, and I don't know if we want to move into our rant stage and save a few minutes for that. But I will start the rant with Google Hangouts uh, for kicking Jess out. This is the second time I was on a V-Connecting session with her about a week ago, uh, and she got kicked out of that. And so Google Hangouts, what the heck is going on? Because the last few sessions I've been in have not been running smoothly. smoothly so get your act together. It's represented the inclusivity of the company. Yeah. To be honest. It's I irony, but true. So we're gonna re we're gonna rethink Google and YouTube Live. Mm. Um, and can I give a shout out? I don't want to rant. I want to give a shout out to some awesome ladies that are kicking it badass style for mental, May is Mental Health, Mental Illness Awareness Month. Um, I think it's okay to that we talk about that in higher ed, um, specifically to support staff, faculty in there that might not take care of themselves because they take care of learners too much. And so shout out to Kristen Abel and Sue Caulfield. Kristen did this, um, they have this project that they do out of their own pocket and, and goodness to spread awareness and it's called the Committed Project. Um, so I'll tweet it out. Um, I think they've done some amazing things, but Kristen exposed her own self in a really good Pachaka Jaw talk a couple years ago and her coming out has encouraged other um, staff and faculty to say, you know what, I guess, it's, I guess we should be talking about this more and more self-care. And this month she does a showcase of her mental health and what it means to be um, living with it. So every uh, week or so or every few days, someone talks about how mental health impacts those around her. So it could be a coworker, um, her, her partner put something on today, and they just talk about mental health impact is not just the individual, but those around them too. So kudos to the great work you do. And they have a great mental health um, toolkit. I know that Sue's tweeted out, and you should check those fine ladies out. So well done. Uh, I want to do a shout out then. Uh, I don't really have a rant, but maybe it was inspired by a rant. So I told you all about a book that was coming up by Jill Filipovich. It is now out. It is called The H Spot. Uh, it starts with this lead, what do women want? The same thing that men were promised in the Declaration of Independence, happiness, or at least the freedom to pursue it. I've just started reading it. It's a, she's a great writer. She speaks a lot on uh, KCRW and the, the left, right, center. Um, but yeah, it was published uh, just last month and I've done a pre-order. So my rant is, I think this is a book we should all read and it might be fun to um, do some kind of reading, book clubbing, responding around it because um, I think it's exactly where all of us are. Happiness is ultimately what we're hoping in our lives for ourselves and our daughters and kids and and we're talking about the things that have stymied our happiness.
I will say every time you all recommend a book, I put it on a, a wish list. I have a 3WEDU book wish list on Amazon. So I put the link in the show notes if anyone wants to see some of the books we've talked about are recommended. So that's just fine. That's my storage, but I publicly share it. So anyone can look at that. Very cool. Who's going to rant next? Rant or a shout out? Your little rant or a shout out? Yeah, go. <laughs> then I'll, I'll finish with another rant. Enough of all this sickness. Let's all get healthy. <laughs> uh, but I thought I really enjoyed this discussion. And again, I really appreciate Kristen uh, taking the time away from being with her grandmother, who I have never met, but is amazing purely by the fact that Kristen is her granddaughter. And she's celebrating her 91st birthday, which is, which is pretty great. And I hope everyone continues the conversation. I think it's really important to talk about, you know, I, I feel like the systemic change really pulls together everything that we talk about. And see, my dog even agrees. Uh, and so I thought maybe we would finish up just with some summer well wishes to everyone. But I wish everyone a great summer. Uh, and I hope we stay in touch on Twitter and other forms of social media. And we look forward in the fall to hearing about all the amazing, great things that everyone did over the summer and the places they saw and where they traveled. I get to go to Alaska. Pretty excited. Are you going to do anything fun there? You know, I'm trying to figure out a college trip for my kid. and. Uh, um, Oh, you know what? I do have to give like giant thank yous, Jess. I, I won the worst mother ever. I know we only have a few moments, but my awesome kid who I've raised to be completely um, fearless and confident as well as aware of other human beings. So she's not an asshole. And the other night she was in like a battle of the bands at the high school. She told me about it ahead of time. She didn't really explain it very well. That kid stood up on a stage with lights going, singing lyrics to music that she had written, that her guy friend had written the, the songs for. And she is strutting her stuff on a stage, using her giant curly mane of hair as a prop. Kids are screaming at her name. Like, kids who don't even know her are just yelling, Phoebe! And she, like, it was this amazing moment. And I, I said, I was like, how do you win? She's like, well, you tweet it. So I tweeted all of you. I was just like, D -d just do something. Like, tweet for her. So they, there was a band from another uh, high school that won. And they really actually killed it. They were called Boy Band. And it was three super rockin' girls. And there was one kid in the band from my daughter's high school, so they could they could perform. But my daughter's band won the popular vote. So on Twitter, they won the popular vote. But she did get home, and she was like, Mom, she like kind of teared up a little bit. She said, I thought you would invite a lot of people. And I didn't invite anybody. I just thought it was like a high school thing. I didn't even know I was invited. So... Once again, I've won like the worst mother of the year award, but I'm going to be sending everyone a video to just see it's crappy quality. But if you watch the graininess and you listen, she's freaking amazing. And um, yeah, it was super cool to be the mom of an awesome 16 year old in high school who um, who's rocking it. She's not the cool kid. She's not an athlete. She just got up there and said, I got this. Are the cool kids not nerds now, I feel, in high school? You know, she goes to a unique high school where I don't think there's a whole lot of bullying in general. I think kids, I mean, there's a lot of, like, kids whose parents are college professors. And, I mean, in general, it's a diverse town of people who are all economically privileged. So it kind of cancels out the actual diversity, but there's some, you know, there's definitely, we're very like, you know, multinational city, but she goes to a unique high school where cool is pretty fluid. It, you know, I think everybody feels pretty cool at her high school, despite their affiliation. All right, that was my closing second rant. Mm -hmm. All right, and we we have neared seven o'clock, so it's uh, it's time to say goodbye. But I look forward to uh, seeing what conversations follow on Twitter, uh, and.
we will be sure to share all of <laughs> Your dog our, wants to talk. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All of our mm-hmm. all of our travels in this spring. So bye everyone. Ciao y'all. Chocolate, wine, and coffee are good. That's what I have to tell you. Go read the tweet. Science says so. Yeah.